Greetings once again, my beloved brothers and sisters in the loving name of Jesus. I truly want to thank you so much today, brethren, for taking this time once again to join me as we dig deep into the mind of God's precious truth. Today, God has a word for us, brethren, and I, I really want you to give the Lord your undivided attention as we spend the next, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes in the word of God. I just want us to understand that, you see, brethren, who, who is Satan going to attack the most? Obviously, it's those that know the most. It's those that have the greatest amount of truth. It's those that have the greatest amount of power and knowledge. In other words, it's those who have the message of the hour. So, brethren, let me just share these, these words of inspiration from the Bible, and then we're going to go into a little discussion. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning from verse 2, the Bible says, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. Very solemn words, brethren. Now, who is Paul really writing to? Is it to the unbelievers? Or is it to the well-informed? It's to the well-informed. He says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. In verse 5 he says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of the ministry. And that's what we have, we have to do, brethren. Obviously it does also apply to you know, the unbelieving. But the point is, brethren, we have to first bring this message home to ourselves. See, one of the greatest methods that Satan is using today to deceive present truth believers is in trying to make them believe that just because they're preachers, hearers, that they're okay. You see, the wise man Solomon says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We can think that just because we have accepted the message of truth, because we have ascended to a mere theoretical knowledge of truth, that we are okay. Just because we're giving great Bible studies. We're preachers, we're hearers, but we're not doers. See, brethren, just as the body without the breath is dead, so faith without works is dead. Unless we have corresponding works. In the book of Galatians, chapter 5 and verse 6, Paul speaks about, well, he says, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And may I say, brethren, inspiration also adds and purifies the soul. Faith which worketh is my faith, is your faith, is our faith working, my dearly beloved brethren. Faith which worketh by love. Because remember, Paul says, and now abideth hope, faith, and love. But the greatest of these is love. How about faith? Luke chapter 18, verse 8. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? 
I say unto you, Jesus said, that he will avenge his elect speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So we need all three. We need faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch had this testimony before he was translated that he pleased God. By faith, Noah condemned the world. The preacher of righteousness condemned the world because his faith had corresponding works. While he was preaching, his faith was manifested by great works. You see, we're not saved by works, beloved. For by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God. That almost seems to be a contradiction to the words of James, where he says, was not Abraham justified by works? You see, Abraham had the works of faith, not the works of the law. They were not his own works. And that makes the big difference. God said to him, take your son Isaac to one of the mountains that I will show you. And they offer him as a burnt offering. Abraham had the works of faith. His faith worked. And by his works was his faith made perfect. Love. That was love in action. To sacrifice the thing that means so much to you, the dearest. But you see, we need to understand, brethren, that we cannot love the gift more than the giver. Heaven, God, gave Isaac to Abraham as a precious gift. And God tested Abraham. He tested him. And praise God, the Bible says, God will not allow us allow us to be tempted or tested more than we can bear. And as Abraham lifted up the knife, heaven said, that's enough. Now I know, God said, now I know that you love me, Abraham, in that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And, and we're all going to be tested, brethren. You see, the Bible says very clearly in Isaiah 31, verse 6 and 7, it's when every man casts away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which our own hands have made unto us for a sin. That's when the Assyrian power will fall. Which Assyrian? The Assyria of these last days. The Assyria of these last days. The yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. We need the anointing power of Jesus Christ, my beloved, to come into our hearts. Brethren, how can we find it difficult to forgive? If we have received the forgiveness, if we have been forgiven much, Jesus said, he that is forgiven much, the same loveth much and you see brethren we're going to be tested things will happen even within our own ranks that will test how genuine our faith really is whether our faith is really working today and whether it is working by love and is purifying our souls see brethren when we find it so difficult and i'm saying once one year passes and two year passes and three years pass and we are still harboring bitterness that doesn't look good brethren that doesn't look good jesus in matthew chapter 5 he says while you are in the way agree with your adversary quickly quickly leave your gift go and be reconciled to your brother to your sister be reconciled quickly. Now, brethren, three years and four years and whatever it may be, that is not quickly, brethren. 
Why do I know that? Because the Bible says, do not let the sun go, the sun go down on your wrath. Make things right. See, we can cut off the channel whereby we ourselves are forgiven by not forgiving others. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, if you do not from your heart forgive every man, every brother, every sister, every man, every woman, their trespasses, neither will my heavenly father forgive you. That is solemn. Brethren, listen, I'm saying that the seal of God can never, it can never be placed upon any man or woman, boy or girl, that does not possess and have the character of Jesus Christ. What was the character of Jesus like? He was being nailed to the cross, beloved. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Did any of his followers have that kind of love? I think about Stephen. Speaking almost the same words that Jesus spoke. Lay not this sin to their charge while he's being stoned to death. Lay not this sin to their charge. Almost the same words that Jesus spoke on the cross. And that's why I'm saying, brethren, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We cannot allow the root of bitterness to spring up. Because Paul says, and many be defiled thereby. See, my dearly beloved, we do not fully realise that unless we are breathing the atmosphere of heaven, what kind of atmosphere are we breathing out? See, prayer is the breath of the light, breath of, breath, breath of the soul. And unless we are breathing momentarily, daily, the atmosphere of heaven, unless we are fully connected to Jesus. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 15. Except ye abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself. But every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Yes, brethren, we're going to be pruned. We're going to be purified. But purification comes by obeying the truth. You are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you, Jesus said. Peter says you are purified by obeying the truth. And when we obey the truth, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. First John chapter 1 and verse 7. If you walk in the light, the light of truth, even as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, my dearly beloved, we have to be close reasoners and logical thinkers. We need to take a deeper view. We need to take a walk more often and behold the Lamb of God from the time he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Accept him, the kiss of his betrayer who had previously covenanted twice to betray him. Jesus, knowing this, washed his feet. Judas wanted to be first. Jesus served him first in the upper room. John, who bore the likeness of Jesus the most, Jesus' inspiration says, served John the last. <laughs> the wonder Jesus said the first shall be last and the last first. There are many ways we can see that, brethren. You see, it's not always looking at the prophetic. We have to bring the truth home to us so that our characters can be purified by obeying what Jesus has said. So, brethren, forgiveness in these last days is so vitally important. Do we manifest do we reveal in our daily lives because remember paul says in second corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2 and 3 that we are epistles to be read 
among all men. In our daily deportment, in our daily conversations, in our daily lives, Jesus is sending a letter to the neighborhood, to the church, to our families, to the world at large. We have many witnesses who are watching us. And brothers and sisters, you know, I don't really want to go into too much stuff right now, but if we have been forgiven much, then we should love much. And that really bothers me because when I see brothers and sisters struggling so much to forgive, I kind of wonder, has that individual really been forgiven? Has that individual really made the forgiveness that Christ offers his own? Brethren, I'm going to go a little bit deeper at this time. Listen to this. Now, remember Paul says that the time is coming when even those who are married be as though they be not. What I've kind of noticed is that sometimes people who are married, they kind of hide behind the affection that their spouse gives them. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's true that your wife and your husband should defend you, but not to the exclusion of not defending what is truth. If your husband is not doing the right thing, don't pat him on the back. If your wife is not doing that which is righteous, don't pat him on the back. Yes, you must love your husband and love your wife, but let's not encourage that which is wrong. So what am I talking about, brethren? Make things right. Don't think that just because you're going to go and fall into the arms of your spouse tonight, everything's going to be okay and you're going to feel okay. No. And that's why I believe the Apostle Paul says that husbands and wives for a short space of time should separate for fasting and for prayer and then come together again. That is a deep, that's a deep truth, brethren. I believe husband and wives who are together every single moment, every single minute of the day, and every single day of the week, sometimes they, they fail to be quickened by the spirit of truth because they feel, oh, I've got my wife, I've got my children all around me, I'm just going to receive the affection and and commendation from them. But brethren, it doesn't work that way. We have to know that we are doing the right thing in heaven's sight. By faith, we must do that which is right. So my dearly beloved, forgiveness. I'm, I'm really emphasizing on forgiveness today and really doing what is right quickly. Remember, the wise man Solomon again says, if you regard iniquity in your heart, even your prayer is going to be an abomination. So sometimes I wonder, how can I know that my brother has ought against me, that my sister has ought against me? I have something wrong with my brethren and I'm just constantly bringing my gift. God says, listen, stop, stop, stop. Leave your gift at the altar. Leave it. Go and be reconciled quickly while you are in the way. Go and be reconciled. Go and say, I love you. I am sorry. In spite of who is right and who is wrong. Make things right with your brother and with your sister and then go and make things right with the Lord. Now, I'm not saying you can't pray to God before you go to your brethren. I'm not saying that. Because without receiving the grace of Jesus first, we can't, we can't really do things that are right. But let's just not leave it there. Let's just not say, Lord, I'm confessing my sins to you. I've confessed my sins to you. No. Secret sin 
must be confessed in secret to God. Public must be confessed publicly. But there's, there's sins that are of, of an individual nature that we must go. Not because you feel like it, my brother. Not because you feel like it, my beloved sister. See, the just don't live by feelings. The just live by faith, by his faith in Jesus Christ. So leave your gifts. Go and, do, go and make things right so that the leaven of grace can continue to leaven your heart. It worries me, brethren, that when we don't make things right quickly, sometimes I wonder, is the, the process of sanctification going on still in your heart? It's a very solemn thought, brethren. The sealing is a settling into the truth, both spiritually and intellectually. What does that mean? Yes, intellectually, you must have the knowledge of truth, but it's spiritually. The intellectual knowledge must be transforming your character. And that's what the sealing is all about. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 on down. Paul says, in whom you trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, after that you believed, you were sealed. You trusted, you heard, you believed, you were sealed. See, brethren, we have to hear, we have to believe, and this belief is not the kind of belief that the devils have, because even the devils believe that God exists, even the devils believe that God created the universe, but they're bound for, they're bound for hell. See, hell, brethren, is prepared for the devil and his angels. We don't need to go there. My dearly beloved, precious brothers and sisters, please receive what I'm seeking to explain to us today. We as present truth believers have a work to be done in our souls. And this includes all of us. But the closer we are to Jesus, the less of self and self-righteousness, which is as filthy rags in, in God's sight, will be manifested in our lives from day to day. The ordinary, common, everyday kind of sins of foul language, you know, silly jesting, you know, things that are not becoming to a, a Christian who, who should be of holy conversation. But as I said in times past, brethren, the secret remains that we abide in Christ. And I always give this analogy, brethren. Eve, the only woman on the planet in the Garden of Eden. Adam, the only man. What was the first mistake that Eve made that caused her downfall? First, she was separated from Adam. Next, she enters into a conversation with the serpent. But the first step, brethren, see, one step leads to another step. If we don't maintain a vital connection with Jesus, we will never be able to overcome even as Jesus overcame. So Eve was first separated. Who does Paul say is the second Adam in the, in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15? Who is the second Adam? Jesus Christ. Who does the woman Eve represent? The church. 2 Corinthians 11.2, Jeremiah 6.2, Great Controversy 3.81. You see, my dearly beloved, the point is, just like Eve, had she never been separated from Adam, she would have never fallen. See, when she came back to Adam, Adam said straight away, this must be the fallen fall. That's what inspiration says. See, you could not deceive Adam, but Eve was deceived. So likewise, brethren, the church, as long as the church is vitally connected to Christ, 
sin has no more dominion over us. Now, I'm not saying, brethren, that there's times, mysteriously enough, just like Elijah. He was on Mount Carmel. The fire came down, consumed the sacrifice. Elijah slew the false prophets, which is quite interesting because that also shows us that antitypicals Eli antitypical Elijah's message is to bring the message of the slaughter in the church because it was Elijah that slew the false prophets and those false prophets, brethren, not to divert, divert from the subject, those false prophets were all Israelites. So Elijah's message brings the slaughter in, in the church today. But my beloved, Elijah, when he was on Mount, on Mount Carmel, he witnessed the manifestation of God's power. You would have thought inspiration says that from that moment onwards, Elijah would have never lost faith. Paraphrasing what inspiration says there. But then shortly after that, he flees from an infuriated woman. So there's times when faith ceases to respond. Somehow it just does not respond. But that was no excuse in Elijah's message, in Elijah's time, in Elijah's life. That was no excuse because inspiration says despondency is sinful. But God understands. And he came looking for Elijah. Just like he came looking for Adam after Adam sinned. That's right, brethren, the shepherd, the great shepherd, comes looking for the lost sheep. And that's why we have hope. But brethren, let us abide in him and allow his word to abide in us. Because if we do that, if we depend upon Christ and we don't depend upon any other person, whether it be our children, our husbands, our wives, our homes, it doesn't matter. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust a single frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You see, the arm of flesh will fail you. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man or woman or any other thing and does not make the Lord his rock. My dearly beloved, I love you so much. Let us keep strong. Very soon, brethren, this message that we are preaching is going to be hated so much. Jesus said, you're going to be hated by all men. The time is coming, brethren. We are going to be hated and the truth that we are preaching is going to be hated. Therefore, brethren, let us learn to love one another today. Today. If today you know that you are not in harmony with your brother, your sister, your, whoever it may be, leave your gift at the altar. Go today. Be reconciled. While you are in the way, quickly. Lest you be delivered to tormentors, into prison. Jesus said you shall not come out until you have paid the uttermost farthing. That doesn't sound good because we cannot pay that debt. We cannot pay that debt. Only one. John wept in the book of Revelation chapter 5. Because no man was found worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Then one of, the, one of the elders said to John, 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 do not cry, my brother. Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Oh, yes, brethren, there's only one worthy. But let us not presume upon his worthiness. Let us not think just because we have his name. Let us not be like the people in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 1 who say, Oh, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Oh, no, brethren. Let us allow Jesus to manifest his love, his grace, his spirit, his character in our hearts and in our homes. Love you so much, brethren. Till we meet again, may God bless you and keep you. I love you so much. In Jesus' precious name, I hope these words have been a source of encouragement. Until we meet again, in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen.
glory be to God. Amen.